Hi, everyone. Matt Till here with the Ephesiology Podcast. Thanks so much for joining us and being along on this journey with us. Uh, we are beginning a conversation uh, between Michael, Andrew, and myself on this podcast. It's going to really take about three parts. The first part you're about to listen to, and it is regarding this idea or the concept of the legacy church and its role in movement making. Now, we're going to just be unpacking some of the ideas and concepts behind this idea of what a legacy church is and its importance to movement making. We're just going to be introducing the topic on this part. And then on part two, we're going to unpack some of the thoughts and ideas that came about in this particular episode. And that will be released uh, very soon or within about a week or so after you hear part one. Now, after that, uh, we're going to have a third part to this, and we want to invite you, the listener and the watcher, to actually to join us in this conversation. So we want to invite you to send in uh, your questions and your comments and your thoughts on this topic, and we would love to engage with you in conversation on this very issue. Now, with that said, uh, we think this is going to be an important and helpful conversation for all of us, and so we invite you to join us as we listen in and as you participate with us in this conversation regarding the Legacy Church and movement making. Welcome to the Physiology Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the study of the early Christian movement. Uh, today, we're with Michael, our resident physiologist, Andrew Johnson, associate pastor at Neartown Church in Houston, Texas, and I am Matt Till, church planter and lead pastor of Restoration Church uh, in Lake Zurich, Illinois, which is just outside of Chicago, Illinois. Hey, guys, good to be with you uh, on this particular afternoon. Hey, yeah, it's a great afternoon to get together again. I'm excited, and you all look colder yeah. <laughs> than me. Yeah. Yes, uh, I have a feeling we're going to be hearing that for the next few more months, and then every time we hit winter I again. I say, well, yeah. no, 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 it's about to turn the corner, and you're going to be like, hey, Andrew, you look hot. Is there, yeah. is there anything wrong? <laughs> I'm good, guys. Yeah, very true, true. Hey, you know, so what brings us together on this particular episode is that uh, this is a bit of a bonus material that we've uh, decided to record for the podcast, and this kind of came out of a conversation that we just started having on our, with amongst ourselves as we were kind of talking about the content and the concepts of ephesiology and really how does it apply to uh, current tra uh, traditional churches or what has also become known as sometimes as the legacy church, and how does this apply within that context as well as new emerging church um, expressions as well globally. And so this is just kind of a random, a regular conversation that we know that every pastor that's going to be listening in on this is going to be having this very conversation well, is that as I hear these concepts for ephesiology and how do we uh, try to pursue and do a movement within our own context, how is this going to work? And so one of the conversations we decided we thought we'd have together is what is the place and and what do we call this of and how does this all fit and work together? So uh, Andrew, let me just start. Let's just start with you and just kind of. Yeah, I think you were the one who kind of really started this conversation with us. So how about you just share kind of some of your thoughts on this and we'll just kind of roundtable it from here. Absolutely. Well, I am the one who got the cattle prod out. Um, this started because uh, so early on in our conversations, the three of us again off mic, not recorded. Uh, we started talking and. And Michael was introducing me to you, Matt, and then was referencing you, Matt, in the uh, church experience that you were a part of and said that, um, you know, well, you guys are, are uh, in, in legacy churches and a part of a, the legacy church and then continued on in conversation. And, and the nature of the conversation wasn't such that I was going to jump in and say, well, hold up, time out. But what I can say is that in the moment when Michael said, well, Andrew, you're at a legacy church, I felt annoyed uh, on my insides, not because I was like, how dare you? But, you know, I'm a part of a church plant that is eight years old. God is doing amazing things in us, through us, in our community. Um, we are really getting to celebrate a lot of what God's doing. And to be an eight-year-old church plant and to be referred to as a legacy church is almost, it, this is how it struck me, is our end is nigh. We are uh, something of the past. We are something that was, is a bygone era. You know, you refer to something of a legacy when it's in its denouement, when it is about to be done and it's about to close up. And so um, I'm young, I wanna be hip, 
I'm cool. I think I'm a part of a church that's also young and hip and cool and doing a lot of awesome stuff. And and to be referred to as a legacy, I thought, this doesn't fit. And then a few days later, not knowing my reaction to this conversation that we were having, a friend who is or was a missionary and is now heading up a missions, uh, all the missions at their church, which is not a small church. He brought it up and said, you know, I just, I keep hearing that my church and other churches are referred to people who are in church planting movements or CPM and focusing on CPMs refer to those who are a part of traditional churches as legacy churches. And he just said, I wish we could find a better term that didn't sound so uh, subtly offensive or backhanded. And, uh, but again, even the talk of it gets at the root of it is what is the nature of churches that are traditional and established and embracing this, can I say now, a physiological, it, it sounds bigger than biblical, uh, <laughs> a way of actually discipling people and helping point them to Jesus and then growing Christ's church. Is there not just, this is this discussion is not rooted solely in what's in a name but something far different and I think far more uh, impactful. So Michael, what, since I essentially am taking, not, I want to say taking issue with something you said, but what do you define as legacy churches? And then what do you kind of have to say for all of the thoughts I had? Yeah. Th- I mean, those are, g- those are good thoughts. Absolutely. And certainly that term legacy can be used in a pejorative manner. And I think that there might be a bit of that when the term is being used today. Um, we tend to to uh, want to coin new words, uh, new ways of saying old things, and uh, that many have landed on the legacy nomenclature it, it, to replace uh, uh, churches that we used to refer to as institutional. Uh, institutional is is not necessarily a bad thing. It, just like mm-hmm. legacy isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, sometimes, and when we refer to an institutional church, we're talking about a church that has become mainstream in a positive way. You know, it's mainstream because people are used to it. Uh, it has has fulfilled an objective. Uh, it's recognized. It's familiar. Um, so it's not necessarily a, a, a negative thing. In much the same way, legacy church is used not uh, necessarily in a negative way. Uh, in fact, I, I, I mean, I have a preference, I suppose, mm-hmm. in using the, the, the term legacy uh, vis-a-vis institution because legacy is honoring. Uh, there's something historic about it. Uh, mm-hmm. It's been ongoing, and if it's if it weren't for the legacy church, so to speak, we wouldn't be where we are today. Uh, right. Whether that's in the United States, Western Europe, or anywhere else around the world. So, so there's I think there's value in that term, but I can certainly understand how uh, others who might be referred to as a legacy church could take that in a derogatory manner. Matt, how does it hit you? I mean, since you said you came came from a legacy model, mm. and now what you would describe as what you're doing or wanting to do is not legacy. Yeah, you know, and actually, I, I think I, I w- didn't first probably even start phrasing that as a legacy church, if you would, until maybe I think it might have been a conversation with Michael or somewhere around there. I'm not sure if it was with him directly or not. I, I can't quite remember the in, when that idea was brought into my mind, but I was like, it actually put to words, uh, I think, what we were feeling. And actually, the way I was describing it to a number of people is that in our church planting journey, you know, every church is committed to at least every gospel preaching church that like I've been a part of or have encountered is, in fact, committed to the Great Commission. And so we're committed to seeing the gospel go forth and to go to the ends of the earth, as we see even Acts 1.8. And so everybody wants to be on mission, and they have different means and, and methodologies of doing that. And uh, one of the things I think we've walked into is being a church planter in the years of 2017 through currently the 2019. We have seen fundamental shifts in the evangelical world, as well as in uh, North America, especially, and the global and the world as well has been just changing so much that the methodologies of church planting um, that we had been historically using since the 90s and into the early 2000s just is not having and bearing the fruit that it once, it once bore. 
And as a matter of fact, the same people who are doing those church plants are, are you know, have, have found themselves like, we don't even want this. Um, and this is one of the things that we started running into in our actual context is like, we're trying to, you know, I, I was kind of saying this to you guys earlier, and I've, I've used this analogy for a number of other people. It's like video rentals, right? I mean, like, hey, like you want to rent a video, you're going to go watch it on Netflix, or you're going to rent it on iTunes, or maybe, maybe go to Redbox still, right? But, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, why are we still building, you know, like, you don't see a new blockbuster video showing up on your corner this week, you know? <laughs> Because there's one like, left. Yeah, there's exactly just one there's left. There's one left. And I and I'm like, this is how this is how this is for us. Is like, why are we still planting blockbuster videos? The mission mm-hmm. is still the same. The 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 product. I hate using that. I hate using that. You know, blurring these well, two the lines. But the methodology is, you know. But at the end of the day, the the mission is still the same. But the methodology has has got to alter with our context and culture. And I think this is why the study okay. of physiology is so important for us because. It roots us back into the historical Christian movement, but allows us to see it with a little bit more purity and then allow us to draw it to, okay, now what does this look like in 2019? And we can do a little bit of hop, skip, and jump a little bit along the way with church tradition, because I think that's one of the issues is that we like, well, we've got 2,000 years of church history here that we can rely upon. Uh, I mean, are we going to throw out the Apostles' Creed because it's not in the scriptures? Um, no. No, please, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I think we need to, there are going to be things that we're going to hold on to and want to uh, embrace still. But I do see that there's some value by saying, I think that whatever models and methodologies that we had been using uh, may not be as effective moving forward. But as Michael said, there's still value in that. And at the end of the day, who's going to fund the future of the church? Who's going to be able to lead the way of these missions and these movements? It's going to have to come down to, the, the established church, the institutional church, the legacy church that exists, they're going to have to think through ways of like, how do we begin to embrace guys like us or somebody else who's going to say, we want to empower these kind of things. That's where that's where we're at. Yeah, good. I think you're spot on. I mean, by using that term legacy church, by no means are we saying that we want to do away with a legacy church. Now, there is a stream in the church planting movement uh, um Movement. I mean, that sounds funny. A church planting movement. Movement. <laughs> if, you say CP, if you say CPM movement, you CPM just ignore movement. like AJJ, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So you just leave that out. Just repeat it, but don't say what yeah. it means. Yeah, there there is a stream in the CPM movement that's saying, you know what, we need to blow up the legacy church, mm-hmm. um, or we need to work within it up to the point in which we can do away with it. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying, you know what, no. No, that's not the way that we go. I mean, that is not the way of unity. It's not the way of brotherly and sisterly love for one another. Uh, we're a body, and the body of Christ isn't just the local expression. It's all of us together, and we need each other because there are things, like you were saying, Matt, I mean, there are funding things, funding issues that the Legacy Church can step into, but there are other resources. I mean, the Legacy Church in the United States is full of human resources, people who are crying to be genuine disciples and have a way in which they can enact their calling by God in their community. You know, it's interesting, and we'll get into this in one of the other podcasts, but it's interesting. In uh, 2015, a professor named uh, Josh Packard did a study, and uh, he began to categorize people with a with a new moniker called the Duns. And we've heard of the nuns, those yeah. you know who are falling away from the faith or 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 not a part of Christianity any longer, or at least the the institutional expression of it. But what Packard is saying is that, you know, there are people that are done with church and they're done in two senses. They're either done completely and they're giving up their Christian faith altogether or they're done, but they still will practice uh, some form of Christianity in, in the way in which they feel comfortable. They're no longer going to the established church or the legacy church, uh, but they're just finished with that. Those are the people that we need to be thinking about. And, and I think that is, um, I mean, I don't want to talk in terms of a niche, but, but certainly that's an audience that is attracted to the things that we're discussing in a physiology. 
um, it, they're not going to go to the traditional church. Um, it, they want something different. They want something new. And that's a substantial population. Right now, it's estimated to be about 30 million adults in the United States who are oh, done. Wow. Uh, 35 million uh, U.S. adults have said, we're not just done, we're giving up on Christianity altogether. And some of the reasons why they're doing that are, you know, they're, they're tired of the Sunday morning uh, monologue, uh, being told what to do. Uh, they can't fulfill their calling in the church. They can't find community in the church. Yeah. And we need to pay attention to those things. Yeah. And that's what ephesiology is trying to drive us to. You know, let's think, let, let's take our... Uh, the blinders off and how we've been doing church, Matt, like you were saying, or how we've been planting churches. And let's just open up our horizon a little bit and see how can we do this in such a way that we can eliminate that category of the duns and the almost duns and really do, envelop them and draw them in and embrace them uh, in a way that's going to be meaningful for who they are um, and, and for what, you know, what, what, what they sense is, um, their idea of community. I think there's so much that you're saying, Michael, that uh, is resonant to what we are seeing here in Houston, and not just our church, but many churches around us. And the community that God has put us in is that so many people are, you know, again, they they don't hate Jesus. And some people are ambivalent to him. They were raised in it. They're okay with it. Uh, but sometimes we do, even on our best days, have some blinders on we say if you're you are in by quote unquote fitting in this exact area and in this exact way through ephesiology is again keeping the center of the mission the center of the mission right. and not substituting Jesus out and putting something or someone or some model or some method in its place and now Jesus looks really really white and he looks like he has a certain income and he listens to certain music and and this is the only only the people that kind of fit this that's who Jesus is for you know we don't want that at all at all and so to embrace truly i mean i, I really feel in Houston we are you've put into terms you're using different words that we use but how do we embrace the nuns and the duns mm-hmm. um by continuing to bring them into a, a healthy community and a relationship with Jesus. Um, but it's not, well, you know, and that community, I'm sorry, Andrew, that community no, might look completely different than what it is that we think uh, right. that it should look like. Um, and that's, and that's what we have to do. I mean, we have to, we have to uh, begin to think outside of the Sunday morning experience, mm-hmm. um, it, it, begin to think outside of what's been referred to as an attraction model or seeker sensitive, um, model and really begin to think in a movement model that's saying, you know what, I'm going out to get them. I'm going out to build a relationship with those people. I'm not waiting for them to come because they're not coming. They've left. And so whatever it is that I'm doing that I think is going to attract them to my church on Sunday morning, I need to stop and and think differently um, and uh, outside of that box and go after them because that's, I mean, that's who Christ is. That's um, who Paul was. I mean, they were going after those people um, because they were, they knew God was in pursuit of a relationship with them. And so we, we need to do the same and not just sit back and wait for people to come. You know, so often I find, I think this is becoming a, um, this is a bit of a North American problem that we were, as we're becoming more post-Christian, right? We're now dealing with these categories of nuns and duns, right? Um, and I think even inside of a lot of our churches, we kind of have this make church great again mentality, um, which oh, I stop think, that. Yeah, <laughs> right. be careful. Well, Poke. you know what? I was, I'm poking, yeah. and, but I'm doing it on purpose, and it's very intentional because I think we have to be careful about that kind of attitude that we just say, well, we just got to make church great again. And that's when everyone's going to come back. And rather, the world has changed under a lot of our feet, and we're still trying to figure it out and um, and wade through it. And it's time for us to re- find where our roots are. It's not in our economy. It's not in consumerism. It's not in our capitalism. It's not in uh, the president's. Uh, it's not in our government. It's not in our politics. It is in Jesus Christ and his kingdom alone. And with that, it will require... Countercultural decisions and a way of life 
and mission that goes against the grain of so much of what we have grown up in in modern day America and North America. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to ask the question uh, to Michael and Michael, how is this kind of does this conversation happen? You're you're more attuned as what's happening globally. Um, how is this conversation different in in global settings? Um, I know that's kind of hard to just ask you in one question since I know there's so many other kind of contexts. But can you just speak to that a little? I mean, can you just speak to that a little bit? Uh, just to my you know ignorant mind on this. Sure. I mean, you're, we're hearing similar conversations in Western Europe, for example, yeah. um, but in other parts of the world, in South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, Latin America, um, the, the conversations aren't like this uh, because the experiences aren't the same. And um, yeah, so, you know, the different contexts are going to raise different issues. But um, the one thing that is in common, though, through all of these is the need of what you just said, you know, for a rootedness in our identity in Jesus Christ. And that's what a physiology does, because that's that's Paul's heart is uh, building, making sure that that movement that began in Acts 19 and 53 AD, making sure that it's rooted and grounded in an identity uh, as adopted children of of mm. the father. Right. And uh, and it's that identity then that motivates and uh, inspires us to uh, continue on God's mission. Um, and, and so, yeah, so the conversations are a little bit different in different places. Um, and overseas, I mean, one of the, the issues that I will foresee or am foreseeing is that we're going to come to the point because we have emphasized more of an obedience-based discipleship of of becoming institutional because obedience-based discipleship it seems to me is saying that these are things that you do or in other words these are things that you don't have to do if you want to be disobedient um, um, and and i contrast that with an identity-based uh, understanding of who we are as as seeing our identity inspiring us to be responsible as uh, as God's co-laborers to fulfill his mission. Uh, obedience is a choice. You can do it or you can not do it. Identity, you have no choice. You can't choose whether sense? not to be human. Right. Yeah, exactly. I, I was talking with somebody this morning at breakfast, and we were talking about um, th this exact topic. And um, uh, I, I made the illustration of being an American. You know, if for an American who's patriotic, uh, their identity it gives them the pleasure of standing for the national anthem, uh, s saluting the flag, saying the Pledge of Allegiance. And they do this out of a sense of responsibility and duty, duty because of who they are. It's not an act of obedience. It, it, it's a sense of responsibility. The same is in terms of our relationship with the Lord. Um, it, we do what we do, not because we want to be obedient, but right. because this is who we are. And that was Paul's emphasis uh, in that movement in, in the early church. That's exciting. How do you guys think and uh, that we can be of an encouragement to, let's say, the pastor that's out there right now who's like, man, uh, you, you're talking about this legacy traditional church. That's me. I'm there. I've got this heart for mission. I've got this heart for movements and wanting to see this um, happen. But there's so many institutional things that I'm I'm caught up in. I, I'm. You know, if, if we decided to start diverting our funds away from staffing, you know, people are going to leave. If we start diverting our funds away from the building, what are we, where are people going to meet at? You know, I, I think there's just so many things and questions that maybe sometimes are unnecessarily there. Um, and not to say that they've got to change their entire model, but rather how can we encourage the pastor who's sitting there going like, I'm leading one of these churches right now, but I know that we believe in the movement of God and his Holy Spirit in our community. We want to be a part of that. Um, what's, what's our encouragement to that pastor today who's listening to this podcast? I think the first step is, um, when you sell the building, make the checkout to near town church. Um, <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. No, I, no, kid, no. I kid. I kid. Oh, that's right. That's, a that's all right. It's a donation. Going. Yeah. It's for Michael. <laughs> it's for the ministry. It's for the book. Okay. Yeah. Jesus. Okay. Um, 
In truth, uh, Matt, your question is not just timely, but it's appropriate because I would I would say a an overwhelming sense of the number of churches in America that might come upon this podcast are coming from a legacy model. Mm-hmm. Um, they are not listening to the podcast because they're really, really excited to uh, have somebody preach to the choir, you know, kind of like, oh, yeah, I know this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like, I want uh, the tone of what we're talking about, what Michael has said, what you have said, is that the Legacy Church is not the devil. The Legacy Church is not evil, and we're not going to talk about pastors or churches who are in that model as if they are failing, and they will only succeed once they, like he said, get rid of the building, get rid of staff. Um, that, That will cause its own set of ripples and adjustments Absolutely. and difficulties. Um, I think the first yeah, there's a there's a place for that. Yeah, absolutely. There's a place for that in in uh, in our American uh, Christian context. I think I was going to say the encouragement to be is what's the driving question? Like continue to ask what's the driving question to what you're doing at church? Um, is it how do we make disciples of Jesus, who are going to make disciples of Jesus, who are going to make disciples of Jesus. I think that should be a driving question, Um, not just for how do we operate a Sunday morning, but what is this, is this ministry going to be something that leads to that and, and a new expression of God's image born out through his church body in this community so that they can see the goodness of Jesus? Or is this something just so we can get butts and seats. Um, I think, I think just my, my encouragement is keep asking the question, you know, what's, what's driving this. And I mean, is, is it so churchy just to say, you know, is this really an honor to Jesus? Mm-hmm. But that's, I don't know. Sometimes maybe we're not asking that question. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think even more, uh, Andrew, as I think about the drive, the drive behind this, um, I, I think it can be boiled down to one thing, and that is, uh, how do we make more worshipers of God? Mm. Uh, um, that's what God wants. I mean, that's that's ultimately His desire, um, is to see more and more people worshiping Him. And so, what do we do then to help make that happen? How do we partner with God? Uh, just like Paul was saying in First Corinthians three, we're co-laborers. And that's a that's that's an identity uh, that we take on, and a privilege, as well as a responsibility, to be sure that whatever it is that we're doing, and whatever model of church that we're using, attraction, seeker sensitive, if we call it a legacy institution or whatever, that that is what drives us to bring more and more people to worship before the throne. And if it's anything else outside of that. Then I think we're missing we're missing uh, God's heart. Yeah, Amen, Amen to that. Can we get like practical just for a second? And I'm thinking like let's say um, you've got um, let's say you're a pastor of a church right now, and maybe you've been seeing some some growth, and you're starting to kind of have the conversation, and the budget's been up, and God's just blessing with whatever's happening at your church right now. And you're starting to have the conversation. You're going, okay, we have a decision to make here now. The decision is, are we going to uh, extend? Are we going to do an uh, expansion on the building? Uh, are we going to make? Are we going to go to a second service, a third? Maybe we're, we're maybe we're maxed out on services right now. Um, are we going to do that capital campaign, or are we going to do? Um, you know, maybe we're thinking about going multi-site. What would you say to like that pastor that's like, man, we're seeing some good things happening here, and now we're just trying to trying to figure out like. If I want to be a movement maker, if I want to be seeing would you be giving that pastor right about now? What kind of conversations might you be having with that person? Yeah, th- well, that's a great question and and quite an issue. I mean, it's it, it's going to take a podcast or two or three just to address that. And I think, it, you know, seriously, I um I think the way that we might want to approach this is to invite uh, one of those pastors in on this conversation. That's and, true. Um, and and have a discussion um, rather than to presume on him. I, I know. Yeah, I mean it's it's such a difficult question because I know that uh, the hearts 
of pastors is to are, are to see their churches grow. Um, uh, and I think the question, though, that we have to be asking is, are we seeing the growth that we would anticipate from the things that we're doing? And mm. is that growth uh, transforming our society? And so, that's a great question. Uh, and, and that, I mean, that's a, one of those, um, I, I think, um, uh, benchmark questions for us to answer. Uh, the trends right now in the United States have, uh, are downward in terms of Christian growth, um, and they have been downward since the 1990s. And so, you know, if we think very pragmatically about this then, and, and we ask the question, well, if the trends are going downward, but we're still doing the same things, then that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so what, what is it that we need to change so that we see the trends reverse and, and, uh, and begin to see a percentage gain of the population? Uh, and that's what ephesiology is trying to do, is trying to, to provide a response uh, based on the, that tremendous movement and growth that we saw in the early church that we think can happen here and really begin to shift uh, our culture back on a positive upward trend in terms of uh, the percentage of growth of the Christian population. Hmm. What, I'm, what I'm hearing you say, uh, Michael, is that it's going to take an ecosystem, right? It's going to take an ecosystem of, of churches to live on mission and to see this movement take place. Yeah, I mean, that's a great way to, to put it, an ecosystem of churches, absolutely. I, I mean, it's not, again, it's not, we can't do this in isolation. I think those days have to be gone. Yeah. Uh, the denominationalism, um, the, uh, you know, the one church on the corner trying to outbuild the other church on the corner so they can attract more people. I mean, those, I think those days need to be over because people see through that. And we need to be thinking about what does it look like genuinely to be the body of Christ um, where we are and how do we work uh, together collaboratively to see transformation happen in our society Amen. In, the, in our communities. Yeah. Amen. Andrew, do you have any uh, final thoughts here as we wrap it up? I'm not even going to attempt to top it. Uh, instead, I'm going to say I was really, really encouraged by this conversation today, especially on the, you know, we have just laid block one of the 800 blocks of the foundation before the building. Like this is a this is a starter conversation. This is a necessary piece uh, for us all to consider. How do we make the most worshipers? How are we faithful with what God's given us? And even in is the context that I'm in, am I an outlier? as opposed to the norm, you know, my church is killing it. Cool. Is that an outlier? Is that a norm? Mm. It's a good question to ask. Yeah, it is. That is. Well, thanks guys. And thanks for this uh, helpful and I hope edifying conversation. It sounds like for, at least for us, um, and I'm praying the yeah. same just for those who are listening to this right now. And really we want to invite you, the listener to continue the conversation with us by Absolutely. being part of this community. And so uh, what ways you can do that is first is you can go back and like our Facebook page, Ephesiology. Uh, you can also comment, like, and share the content which is being shared there and also send us a message with your questions and comments. And then secondly, get exclusive content and the video of this very podcast at ephesiology.com. Be sure to register there. We'd love to say again to invite you to into this conversation with us. And also want to invite you to subscribe to the Ephesiology podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, wherever you'd like to get your podcast. And while you're there, make sure you give us a favorable rating and leave an awesome review so that you can help others find this content and benefit from this conversation just as you have today. Well, with that, uh, with for Michael, Andrew, and myself, thanks so much for tuning in and listening, and we look forward to uh, conversing with you on this great topic of ephesiology next time. Mm -hmm.